Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. I uh, want to get started. So I'm talking about a connection between knot theory and number theory. And at the very tail end, I will talk a little bit about uh, joint work with, uh, with two fellows uh, at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And uh, we just um, had a paper accepted um, in the Journal of Discrete Mass. Now, um, um, this last talk, uh, this last part of it, I know that most of you will not understand, and so that's perfectly fine. But for the first 80% uh, of this talk, everybody should be able to follow. So um, here's an outline. I will talk about a number theoretic concept of a continued fraction. Then I will introduce a little bit knots on links, and then I will talk about the connection between knots on links and this continued fraction thing. And then at the end, as I said, I will, I will show you a formula which uh, you can just say, whoa, that looks complicated. And, and um, there are some people here who are working with me in my knot theory group and they are talking um, after this. And so they will get a little bit more out of that last talk. All right, so what is a continued fraction? Well, a continued fraction is simply uh, a, Symbol, which consists out of integers c naught up to c n, and they're sort of strung together in a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. So it's like a nested fraction construction, and clearly uh, the c n cannot be zero because then I'm dividing zero at the end. All right. So some of you may have seen this, and others may not. So let's look at some concrete examples. So suppose I take the number eight over thirteen then I'm essentially using um, something which we call the Euclidean algorithm or it's called the division algorithm. And here's how it works. 13 clearly is one times eight plus five. And then you're gonna shift the eight to the left side of the equation and um, say eight is one times five plus three. And you continue doing this, five equals one times three plus two and three equals one times two plus one and two equals two times one. Now, one of the things you should see here that this remainder term five, three, two, one decreases all the time. And because that remainder term decreases, then uh, um, um, this process will stop. And so if you look at the quotients I generated in order, it's one, 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 two, and that gives rise to this uh, symbol here, um, zero, one, 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 two. And if you, uh, actually want to do some arithmetic, you can check that this continued fraction uh, amounts to eight over 13. So let's go do this. One plus a half is three halves. The reciprocal of three halves is two thirds. One plus two thirds is five thirds. The reciprocal is three fifths. One plus three fifths is five eighths. The reciprocal is, uh, uh, no, it's, it's eight over five. The reciprocal is five eighths and plus one gives you a 13 over eight and then taking the last reciprocal as eight over 13. Now, the interesting thing about these continued fractions, there's nothing unique about this. So here is another way of how I did this. So instead of saying 13 divided by eight is, um, is uh, 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 one times eight plus five, I can say that it is two times eight minus three. Well, that's certainly true. And if you look at the tail end, you have negative three plus two minus one zero. You can see that these guys still uh, decrease if you take the absolute value of them. And so this gives rise to a different continued fraction. There it is. You can do the arithmetic and check that this also becomes eight over 13. Um, here's a, another way of doing this, which uh, may be even more crazy. So I can say 13 is equal to 20 times eight minus one, four, seven. Well, that's a true statement. And then I'm gonna play around with this negative one, four, seven and the eight and just continue my algorithm. And again, in absolute value, the, um, the remainders of this division process, uh, they decrease. And so that symbol here is now denoting a continued fraction, a much more complicated continued fraction but if you actually were going to calculate it out, it still gives you eight over 13. OK, 
Okay, anybody, any questions so far? Oh, no. Somebody is not muted and I don't hear a question either, so not sure what to make out of it. But um, that is uh, the concept of a continued fraction. Now let's talk about knots first in general, and then I will relate it to this continued fraction concept. So what is a knot? A knot is a closed curve in space that does not intersect itself. And um, we present this by a projection, and here's a picture of a knot, okay? So basically we draw the knot in the plane and to indicate the three dimensionality, you can see that there's clearly an over and an under at each of these crossings, which you see there. Okay, so that's a knot. What is a link? A link is a collection of knots and here's the simplest examples. You have two rings and they're sort of interlocked to form the simplest non-trivial link. Now, um, you should think of these, these, um, these curves here think of them as uh, being made out of, a, out of a rubber band. And so you can bend them, you can stretch them, you can do all sorts of stuff. You can't break them. Formally, um, there's a sequence uh, which is defined as Reitermeister moves, which sort of break down these deformations in, in some technical way. But you don't really need to know about this. All you need to know is that think of them as rubber bands and you can do all the manipulations as you can do with rubber bands. And um, the links we're going to talk about, there are called rational links or two bridge links. And here you have a picture. Now, what you see there that at both ends, there are these dots on the right and on the left, and there are two dots. And if you were going to take this guy and rotate it 90 degrees, either to the left or to the right, doesn't matter, then you see that um, these two dots form maxima or minima. And so we call something a rational or a two bridge link if it has a presentation that allows for only two maxima or only two minima. Now uh, it's not apparent to you, but if you're going to trace out this particular symbol, you will find that it actually is a knot but sometimes these things also can be links with two components. Okay, so now um, let's talk about this a little more. And so uh, you may already recognize there on the second line, this P over Q, this is the same symbol I used for a continued fraction. And so how are these guys assembled? And um, I want you to concentrate only on the top picture which uh, starts on the left with A1 and ends on the right with A2M plus one. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna put half twists in these various boxes, okay? Um, and so let me give you a concrete example and then I go back to this slide. So here's a concrete example. And so this has a two, there are two crossings on the left then there are three on the top, then there's one, then there are another three, and then there's another three. Now you notice that um, the two on the left is positive, but the next three on the top there is negative, and the negative one, and so they have signs, and how do we determine the sign? And this is sort of indicated over here. So if you look at the odd boxes, A1, A3, a2m plus one, then you see the sign convention. Um, it is a plus if essentially um, the overstrand goes from the bottom um, left to the top right, and it's a minus otherwise. And so if I look at this next stride, uh, you see for the two, it goes from the bottom left to the top right, so that's positive. And for this guy, it goes from uh, the top uh, left to the bottom right, and so that's negative. That's how these signs come about. Now, for the even boxes, negative A2 up to negative 2 AM, this minus sign in that indicates that the con convention is exactly the opposite. Okay, and so when you see here this negative three, um, that means that it is the opposite of how the two is generated. It becomes negative for these uh, even boxes if, if the bottom uh, left goes to the top right. 
And so these, these things are called rational links because we can sort of talk about them in terms of the same continued fraction thing I mentioned before. But there are some complications. So the first thing I want to talk about is the following. Imagine, envision that this picture which you see there, that there is in the middle, there is a vertical axis and you were going to rotate this picture through a vertical axis by uh, 180 degrees or by pi. Then what you would have, you would reverse the order. So instead of two, negative three, negative one, three, two, three, three, the symbol would start with three, three, then negative one, then negative three, then two. So it's just the order reversed, except that that leading zero stays. So, oops. So you can ask the question, how are these two symbols related? Okay, so there's two, negative three, negative one, three, three, and then below that there is this reverse. And I have computed these continued fractions. You just trust me that I did that right. And what you observe is that the denominators, they're equal. Now you observe that the numerators are not. So you need to ask the question, what is the relationship between 16 and 31? So in general, this is now a number theory question. Suppose you have a continued fractions A1 up to AN and you reverse the order of this, how are things related? And you can try to prove that, how are things are related using uh, having nothing to do with not theory. Okay, so here's the answer, how are things related? So uh, what you see there is the following, that when you multiply 16 times 31, you get 496. And if you divide it by 55, which is the common denominator for both of these fractions, the remainder is one. And so we write this as 16 times 31, this symbol with this triple equal means essentially the remainder under division by 55. That's what that mod means is one. And this is the relationship you can prove in general. If you compare two continued fractions where one of them is reversed, then the denominators are the same and the numerators, they either satisfy this relationship which we just discussed that when you take their product, the remainder is one under division by the denominator, or they're actually equal. Can somebody think of uh, any, any instance where it might be possible that uh, the, the numerators are actually equal? I'll just see if you pay attention. Well, it's a tough question. So <laughs> it could be that this symbol from A1 up to AN is palindromic. So it could be like one, two, two, one. Well, then if you reverse the order, you get one, two, two, one. And so if it's palindromic, then of course nothing changes. Otherwise you have this relationship. So this is a number theory um, idea. All right, so now uh, I need to introduce one more concept and that is uh, the crossing number. What is the crossing number? Well, it is simply the number of these double points you have. So in this particular picture you see there, if you add two plus three plus one plus three plus three, you get 12. And so this is a diagram with 12 crossings. Now the crossing number of the not link is the minimal number of crossings. And in my next picture, I will illustrate this. So uh, you can see this is a hand drawing. So uh, if you take a look at this, this guy right here, this is my hand drawing of the same picture on the very top there. Now you can see this dashed line I have indicated there on the right. And so if you were going to take this over string and sort of pull it in the position of this red dashed thing, then what do you do? Well, this black arc has two over crossings. And once you pull it over there, you only have one crossing. And so if you straighten this out, 
it sort of looks like what you see in the picture below. Now notice what I have achieved by doing this. I have made the picture between the first box and the second box alternating. That is, when you go under, then you go over. Now what I'm going to do is you see this um, dashed arc connecting um, the next arc. And so what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to pull this arc on the bottom into this dashed arc position. And then you get the third picture. And then you're going to keep on doing this. OK, and um, so again, you see a dashed arc, which you're going to pull over. And then you have a last dashed arc. And then you have this picture there on the bottom. OK, so now I want to manipulate this even a little further. So the first thing we observe is if you count the number of crossings, there are only 10 crossings, uh, if I drew this correctly. Uh, um, and then what you observe, um, what you do one more thing is, so what I want you to, to keep this picture in mind and rotate it in a plane by 180 degrees. And so if you do this, you get the picture here at the bottom. And so uh, when you look at this picture at the bottom, what do I do? I take this long arc at the top and drag it around. So it's at the bottom now. And then I just make some minute adjustments on the right and on the left, and I get this picture. So why did I do what I did there? Well, what I wanted to achieve, I wanted to change the representation to a representation which uh, looks like this sort of thing, but only uses crossings which use a positive twist sign. And when you do this, this is the end result. And so you have changed the 2, negative 3, negative 1, 3, 3 to something which is 3, 2, 3, 1, 1. That's what you should be able to see on this picture on the very top. 3, 2, 3, 1, 1. And the interesting thing is, when you compute the continued fraction, you're going to get exactly the same thing. So. I'm not going to prove anything, but I want to sort of summarize in uh, terms of theorems of uh, what we <laughs> what we have achieved here. So the first thing is every rational link has an alternating diagram that is minimal. And I just showed you an example how to make this. The second thing, you can draw such a thing using only positive entries in the vector. And the third thing is the value of continued fractions does not change during these manipulations. So that's a quite a stunning statement because I showed you that there are lots and lots of ways how you can take a rational number and uh, expand it as a continued fraction. Now, if you were going to construct the drawings of these not so links, which that represents, then for different fraction expansions of the same fraction, you get two configurations where, where if you would make them out of rubber bands, you can manipulate one to look like the other, which is really amazing. And this, uh, um, the main theorem here is these things have been classified, which says that uh, um, two such links are exactly equal if either the following two things happen. Either the denominators are equal and the numerators are equal. This is when you take in the second line equation a plus one in the exponent. And we already talked about that happens if the symbol is uh, a palindrome. Or you take the negative one, and that says p to the negative one is congruent to p prime mod q. And so if you were multiplying this uh, p to the negative one on the other side, this would say that p times p prime is congruent to 1 mod q. So this precisely says the product of the numerators, when you divide it by the denominator, the remainder is 1. And so this is why these things are called rational links, because for any positive rational number between 0 and 1, you have a link or not. And you have a statement exactly when they are equivalent. So they are at most two rational numbers in that interval, which give you the same link.
but otherwise they're they're always distinct. So this is all work which was done. Schubert proved this in the 1950s. Okay, so this has nothing to do with any of my work. And so the last uh, three slides I'm telling you about um, uh, work which we actually have done. And um, I will skip most of the details. Uh, I just want to tell you that it's complicated. So um, what you see here is uh, uh, an add-on to Mathematica called um, the knot theory package. And so um, all knots are stored in this knot theory package. And so on the first line, I get Mathematica to draw two knots for me. One of them has 10 crossings and has this notation 1017. That's the, the knot on the left. And the one on the right has notation 9,7. So it's a nine crossing knot. And then uh, below, I, uh, I compute a knot invariant, which is a polynomial. And uh, essentially, um, it has been shown that this polynomial for different knots, no, sorry. If you do this computation on two knots and you get different answers, then the knots are different. This is called a knot invariant. So to you, these two pictures look different. But if you would think about that, these pictures would be made out of a rubber strand. It's not clear at all if you can transform one into the other. And so this polynomial is used to sort of uh, distinguish knots. When I say polynomial, I should be a little bit careful. It is a Laurent polynomial, which uh, um, allows not just positive powers, but also negative integer powers. And so it's not quite the polynomial you're used to. And it has two variables, A and Z. Um, as a further technicality, which, is which I skipped, but um, this is an invariant of an oriented knot. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. And so the only thing I wanted to show, uh, and that's mainly to my <laughs> knot theory group, is that I can um, actually derive a closed formula from the continued fraction for this polynomial. And so the key ingredient is this two by two matrix. And um, the polynomial can be written as a product of matrices. And um, you have no idea what these words mean, but uh, uh, I need to analyze this continued fraction uh, um, um, decomposition, but, but you recognize this A1 up to AN, those are the entries of that continued fraction. And I can express that polynomial entirely in the terms of A1 up to AN. And I uh, involve something called the Fibonacci polynomials, but essentially complicated matrix, um, matrix uh, multiplications. But there is a closed formula for this, which you can actually program. And I have programmed it with Mathematica. Um, for those of you who are a little bit savvy with, uh, with computer science, um, the actual definition of this polynomial is, uh, is recursive and the computation of computing such a polynomial is actually, uh, there's no polynomial algorithm known. So this is NP, okay? And um, um, with this closed formula, at least for this particular class of knots, we can uh, essentially um, calculate um, these things for arbitrarily large crossing numbers. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff, um, but my time is almost up here, so I'm opening it up. Anybody wants to have any question, anything anybody wants to ask about knots or links? Dr. Ernst? Yeah. yeah. What are some applied applications of theory? That is a good question. I will give you two answers to this. Um, it is a question which I typically get. And um, um, it is a question which a mathematician um, would say you can answer as follows. Uh, for mathematics, um, you don't really need applications. All you need is you need to say, this is interesting to me. Okay. That's probably not the answer you were expecting. But think about uh, um, if, if you ask somebody who climbs Mount Everest, why are you doing this? Is that, has, has that any application? No, but I like to do it. Okay, so that's one answer. 
Uh, I'll give you a second answer, which you will like a lot better. There are actually applications of knot theory. And so my, my specialty is actually something called physical knot theory. And so knot theory shows up in nature a lot. Um, the most, uh, the, the, the most, the example which is probably the most relevant to you is that um, um, uh, DNA molecules are very, very long and uh, enzymes act on them all the time in the cell. And uh, you have particular enzymes which you can let go on circular DNA and they actually produce knots. And different enzymes produce different knots. And so you can ask the question, what, what do these enzymes do to do this? Okay, and so this helps uh, the applications in biology of uh, molecular biology um, of knot theory. Um, there are applications in physics. Um, there's a theory of, uh, of certain quarks as knotted quantum flux tubes, whatever that is. And so there are applications of, of knot theory in, uh, in, the, in, in the sciences, but uh, knot theory is, is a branch of mathematics that, that lives within mathematics completely um, by itself without these, these sort of applications. Um, uh, these biological things are, are of interest and I actually have done quite a bit of work on it, but, but I can talk to you some other time about it if you want to know more. Other Thank questions? So um, what if the number is um, irrational? Because if it's irrational, then it's an infinite continued fraction. Um, these are finite continued fractions. And so you cannot yeah. get any irrational, okay? Oh, but okay. clearly you can get irrational numbers if you have infinite uh, uh, continued fractions. But in knot theory, there is no such concept of an irrational knot, at least not that I know of. But Alan, you can, you can uh, invent such a thing, okay? Um, but but I, I'm not aware of any theory of irrational knots. There's only a theory of rational knots. Thank you. Well, thanks for listening in. Okay, my clock says it's time. So welcome to the second uh, talk in this session. We have Ben Hanshu and Calvin Higdon, two Gatton students talking to us about incoherent nullification. Hello, I am Ben, this is Calvin. And as Klaus said, today we're gonna to be talking about our research project, which deals with the incoherent nullification of knots. Right, uh, so first off, a little bit of background information. Uh, a knot is a continuous function of a circle in free space, uh, which is a complicated way of saying uh, it is a closed loop, uh, which might have tangles, twists, and crossings in. Uh, a projection of a knot in three dimensions is called a knot diagram. Uh, now, this three-dimensional representation is a little bit difficult to work with, uh, especially on a computer or on a pen and paper, and so we take a planar diagram, a two-dimensional representation uh, in order to mess with the knots uh, better. And when we have these two-dimensional representations, it is often useful to apply an orientation, uh, which we've done down here with this knot. You can see uh, we've uh, oriented it. And by orient, I mean, we've added arrows uh, to follow along the flow of the knot. Uh, and then that helps us to discuss the relationships of different crossings. Um. So the main way that we categorize knots is by their crossing number. And what is crossing number? Well, crossing number is the minimal number of crossings of the diagram. So this means that if we have a knot, no matter how much we twist it or tangle it or across all of the possible twists and tangles of it, whichever one of those depictions of it has the fewest number of crossings is the crossing number of our knot. And so if you look down at knot 5-2, that is its simplest diagram. And it does have five crossings. So that's where the five comes from. The two just means that it's the second five crossing knot. And so once we have this simplest diagram of a knot, we can turn it, we can orient it as Calvin showed in the last slide and then turn it into a planar diagram code. 
which is very helpful because a computer and Mathematica can't really manipulate like a graph with the kind of skill that we require. So what we do instead is we convert it into numbers, pretty much. We turn the graph of the knot into numbers that tell the computer like where the strands are, where they pass over each other, and how they interact. And so in the demo file, if we do draw PD of knot 86, you'll see that it does in fact have eight crossings if you want to go through and count them. And then if we do the PD code, you can see that it is uh, each one of those like parts of the PD code represents a crossing. So if you look, there's eight groups of four for eight crossings. And this contains all the information of the knot. And that's what we use in our code. Right. Um, when we take these crossings, uh, oftentimes we'll want to manipulate them, uh, change them in some way. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways that we can do this. Uh, after we orient the knot, uh, and we have arrows going across the knot following it, uh, crossings are either going to be positive or negative, uh, depending on which strand comes on top, uh, along with the orientation of both arrows pointing down. Uh, and when we move from one of these, uh, K, K plus to K plus, or vice versa, uh, it's called a strand passage. Uh, you can imagine taking two strands of a knot and passing one through the other. Uh, to result in the opposite diagram. And when we go from K pause or K plus or K minus to one of these two, uh, we call that operation a nullification, right? Because that gets rid of the knot entirely or it gets rid of the crossing entirely, right? It nullifies it. Uh, so when we uh, smooth them out such that the arrows are still pointing down, right? Uh, imagine the arrows going across this entire line here and across this entire line, uh, you can see they're still going the same way. Uh, but when we go from one of these to uh, K infinity, uh, we see the, the ones on the top uh, run into each other, they clash, uh, and the ones on the bottom run away from each other. Um, and so this one uh, going from either of these to K infinity does not preserve the orientation. It destroys the orientation, uh, which is why it's called an incoherent nullification as opposed to one who preserves, uh, preserves the orientation, which we call a coherent nullification. Uh, our project specifically deals in incoherent nullifications. Uh, and down here, you can see an example of an incoherent nullification being carried out. Uh, so we make these two arrows to run into each other and these two arrows to go away from each other and that gets rid of the crossing. Uh, and then you could imagine taking this figure and untwisting it to end up with uh, a loop. Uh, like we said, this destroys the orientation of the knot. Uh, so we no longer know which direction the arrows are supposed to be flowing into because they are running into each other. Uh, we could then apply a new orientation, uh, but this is just to represent the fact that incoherent nullifications get rid of the orientation. Um, are there any questions so far? Okay, hearing none. Uh, I'll go back for another little demonstration. So if this will load, we have uh, a representation of the knot 8.5. Um, and then uh, this function is a function that we've written in Mathematica that will nullify all the crossings individually, uh, separately from one another of 8.5. And then we end up with these different knots, depending on which crossing we nullify. Uh, so if we were to nullify this one, for example, uh, this gets closed off and then we untwist that, uh, right? Because this can just be untwisted right here. And then we end up with uh, five one. Whereas if we nullify one of these, uh, we end up with seven four. And I'll pull up seven four here uh, just to show what that would look like. They have very similar diagrams because you're not changing much. You're just changing the center piece uh, by the incoherent nullification. Yeah. So 
if we have a not k with n crossings, if we perform a nullification on any of its crossings, we will get what we call a child knot. And as Kelvin showed in the example, depending on what crossing we nullify, we can get different children. So if you look down at the bottom there at not 6, 2, depending on which crossing of it we nullify, we could get any of those three knots to the right. They are all its children. And a property of incoherent nullifications is because they make the knot simpler, they reduce the number of crossings, that there will always be a way down to the unknot, which is just the closed loop, right? Eventually, we will be able to nullify it to the unknot. And so for 6.2, this would look like performing this first step of nullifications and getting these three children, and then finding the children of each of these repeatedly until we get to the unknot for each of them. Right. Um, and then I can go over here. Uh, and then if we were to look at what the knot 7.5 nullifies to, for example, we see 6.5 or uh, I'm sorry, we see 6.2, 5.2, and 4.1, which are all the different possibilities nullifying different crossings of 7.5. Um, and then if we actually draw this um, real quick. Uh, so here's 7.5, here's 6.2, 5.2, and 4.1. Uh, and, and you could imagine how nullifying different uh, crossings of 7.5 could result in these children. Um, uh, when we nullify a knot, it's useful to uh, try to figure out what knot it is, right? We want to know that. And when you're working with a computer, it's not always easy to identify that. Uh, and so we need uh, invariants, which are calculatable quantities that are always going to be the same for a given knot no matter its representation or no matter how many twists and turns you add into it. Uh, Klaus talked about the home flight polynomial earlier, uh, and we actually use the home flight polynomial to identify knots in our project. Uh, so what happens is we nullify a knot and then we untwist all the twists in it, and then we try to find his home flight polynomial to figure out what it is. When Calvin uh, says we untwist all the twists, he means extra ones. Yeah, all the extra twists. Um, Right. And so for a given knot, no matter its representation, this will always be the same, uh, which is why it's called an invariant. Uh, and so we can go down here uh, and then we find the home flight polynomial of the knot 927. Uh, and as you can see, it's very complicated. Uh, it, it requires a really complicated recursive uh, algorithm that you apply to the knot to find its home fly polynomial. And then if we were to go to like 932, um, notice it's completely different. Uh, and, and so these home fly polynomials are uh, very different, very delicate, uh, even for the same number of crossings. Uh, so the main question of our research is what happens when we nullify knots? There are a bunch of questions surrounding this though, like which knots only nullify to one knot? Like you saw it um, with 3-1 earlier when we had the example of an incoherent nullification on the PowerPoint. Because it's symmetric, no matter which crossing you nullify, you'll get the unknot. Yeah. And there's the other side of this. Uh, which knots tend to nullify to the most unique children, which not tend to have the most unique children. So we can, we've found so far knots that have um, the crossing number minus one unique children. Is there any knot that has the same number of children as its crossing number, for example? Those are the kind of questions that we're trying to find answers to. And to find these answers, we need lots and lots of data. And by the way, by virtue of the way knots work, there's one three crossing knot, one four crossing knot, two five crossing knots. It increases exponentially. There's 169 10 crossing knots. 
we need to calculate higher numbers of knots to get more data. And we have done this so far on our uh, personal computers for knots up to and including 12 crossings. We found the children for all knots up to and including 12 crossings. But the problem is, is that as you increase this, it exponentially, exponentially increases because as you go up, you have more knots to nullify, like the 13 crossing, I believe there's thousands. And each one of those, you have to nullify multiple, you have to nullify it more times. Like if we have a three crossing now, we only have to nullify it three times to find all its children. But a 13 crossing one, we have to nullify 13 times to find every child. Right. And we have plans currently to use the WKU supercomputer to do any further calculation of children. Uh, are there any questions so far? Any at all? Okay. Um, so here is a little chunk of what we found. So here uh, in each entry, you find a knot and then you find all of its children. Uh, and so you can see we have the knot three one uh, and then the unknot pops up three times. Uh, right, we explained that earlier. Uh, no matter which one of these crossings you nullify, uh, you can untwist the rest and then you'll end up with the unknot, uh, just a closed loop. Um, uh, as you get more and more higher crossing knots, uh, you can see the number of children varies a lot. So if you go to 7-1, uh, again, we only have the unknot as a child, just a closed loop. But then if you go to 7-6, uh, we have four different types of knots that you can get, depending on which crossing you nullify. And so uh, a couple of our research questions have been, like Ben mentioned, uh, which, which knots have the most number of children and which knots have the least? Uh, and so we'll show a bit of that. So looking at knots with the highest number of children, we don't want to actually look at which ones have the most just in like pure number because it's always going to be the, or not always, but almost always going to be the highest crossing number knot because there's, we can say, oh, a knot with a hundred crossings will have more children than any knot with 10 crossings. But what we look at instead is how it relates to the crossing number. So the current example on the screen is six crossing knots and the highest number of unique children is three, which is n minus three. Six minus three is three. And this is holds true for seven as well. n of seven minus four is three, holds true for eight, but eventually it will turn into n minus two. And then even further past that, it will eventually turn into n minus one. That's what we found so far. We don't think we'll find one where it's n, but it's something worth looking at. Right. Um, and uh, so something else to note about these is that most of the ones that have one child are symmetric which makes sense because if we go back up and look at some of them. You can go down. Oh, yeah, sorry. If, if we look at the knots with one child, they're symmetric most of the time. Because if we, it, looking at the knot 818, you can see how if we nullify any of the, any of the outer crossings, it would be the same as nullifying any of the other outer crossings and the same for the inner crossings. So it's kind of like which ones have the symmetry combined with both of, with all of the symmetries leading to the same knot. So eventually we will see some weird examples, but right now all of them are pretty symmetric, which makes sense. 10157 is one of the um, examples where it's not symmetric. And that's something else we're looking at in our research, which examples are not as simple as the rest and why are they different? What makes them different? And 
whether there are any common characteristics between them. Right. Uh, and so we've got all this data up to this point. Uh, and so we're just trying to find patterns among the, the, the examples that we have so far. Uh, but we're hoping to nullify higher crossing knots in order to uh, be able to make more general statements about uh, what these knots are nullifying to. Um, right. Uh, that sums it up. Are there any questions? Okay. Is, is there uh, a Matthew way to find sent knots? one in chat? Um, is there a way to find knots that are parents of a certain knot? Um, yes. So the easiest way to do it is if you've already calculated the children of a knot, and then you can just look through the list and see which knots lead to it, right? Um, Another way you could do it is to take a knot, and then for each strand, uh, imagine adding a crossing between those two strands. Uh, but that would require a lot of calculations, and it yes. just isn't feasible. Uh, your, another problem that you'd run into is I think that there's infinitely many parents of a given knot. Because right. if you can have some like a hundred crossing knot that has one nullification that's made, and then like 90 something crossings all cancel each other out. And right. then you're left with a little bit. If we go back up here to the list of all the knots and the ch children they have, you can see that we have a seven crossing knot right here that has three one as a child. And so it's it becomes apparent that you could you could just follow this all the way up, and you'll still be finding three one as a child of higher crossing knots. Um, and so it's not really possible to find all the parents of a given knot. But it is possible to find all the parents up to a certain crossing, which we do look at some. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Matthew raised a great question here because uh, you could ask the question, can you reverse engineer it? So if you have a diagram and you want to look at the parent, which has just one crossing more, and you might be able to directly do that from a given diagram. Mm -hmm. And Wade asked, any ideas what you might find with knots that have crossings of 13 or greater? So the thing is, is that we're not really sure. Um, there are a couple of guesses that we can make. Like uh, we could guess that uh, the 13 crossing knots will have knots such that the number of children is, uh, are there 12 unique children? judging by the patterns that we've seen in 11 and 12 crossing knots, right? Uh, we found 12 crossing knots that have 11 children uh, and so on and so forth. And we could also uh, venture to say that uh, there's only one knot that has one child. Uh, well, no, actually we couldn't venture to say that. Uh, but we know that the knot 